Well, I was born in the Midwest in Indiana, in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, my parents were both, my biological parents were both really young people, and they started a family. My father finished grad school, and we moved to the East Coast when I was about five. All my earliest memories are with my grandmother in Terre Haute, Indiana. She, her name was Loretta, and she, uh, she used to be president of the Audubon Society, and she was a huge bird activist until the very end. She would plant, she spent the last years of her life planting um, flowers and, and bushes so that the migratory, migratory um, butterfly population and bird population would have places to stop in her neighborhood in Florida, and she yeah. was pretty cool. And my grandfather was a heart surgeon, and we lived for the first six years in a place called uh, Rocky's Edge, which the man who made the shape of the Coca-Cola bottle, yeah. it was his summer home. So I grew up, I grew up in my, with my grandmother, and in between the carriage house where I grew up and my grandmother's room was this huge arboretum. So I would go through this greenhouse, and on the other side every morning was my grandma. So the early memories are pretty magical. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we, we um, I kept parents divorced when I was young, and, uh, we wound up in Lancaster. My mom met a man, and we wound up in Lancaster um, after she decided to make a life with him. That didn't go so well. No, that didn't go so well. <laughs> All right, so tell me a little bit about it. Well, that. that's, that's a little touch and go. <laughs> okay. there's, there's so many layers of it. Um, he was an abusive alcoholic, and um, alcoholism, of course, was his coping skill. He, um, he had a lot of self-loathing. Um, he, he was a closet transvestite. Um, he, he wasn't able to be who he was because we live in a culture where people aren't able to ever be who they're supposed to be. And not only does that individual suffer, but if they go throughout their entire life self-loathing and hating themselves, who they are, they hurt everyone around them. So his coping skill was alcohol. Mm -hmm. And he, there are four of his kids. And um, at at individual times, we all wound up in foster care. Um, I wound up in foster care when I was 13 years old. Um, my stepfather was overzealously religious, and I used, used religion as a form to justify gender roles in the house and also to justify punishment. Like uh, an average, I spent most of my fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade years. No, I'm sorry, I left when I was in seventh grade. Um, having to copy Bible verses, you know, a thousand at a time pages of Bible verses. I'm not allowed to wear pants, I could only wear dresses. And then when I was 13 years old, I had gone up the street to check in on a friend. We lived in New Providence, whose father was ill, and <clears throat> I wore pants. And my stepfather came home that night and proceeded to, um, Ab physically abused me to the point uh, I had two cracked ribs and wound up in St. Joe's Hospital and spent um, Christmas there my 13th year and wound up in foster care. Oh my goodness. So what was the foster care situation like? At first I was, I went from a few relatives to relatives. Um, I was in Texas for a while with an aunt and went back and forth between my grandmother and my aunt. And my grandmother kind of always did what she could. Um, my freshman year of high school, I was with my grandma. And that was a blast. That was a blast. But my grandfather died um, early that year of my high school um, years. And she was really quite devastated. And at that point, my mom had finally found the courage to leave my stepdad and grandma believing that things would change, um, sent me back up to Lancaster to live with my mom. And I was there for m maybe three months of my freshman year of high school before I, I wound up in foster care and a, as, you know, as a ward of the state. Yep. You said in the notes that I read that ending up in foster care was probably the best thing that could have happened to you. Absolutely. I think it was probably, it probably saved my life because I don't know how much farther the abuse would have gone. And I also, you know, you, you learn a lot. You learn a lot when you have to grow up immediately. I mean, I definitely missed out on a childhood. But from the age of 14, you know, I've worked full time. 
I, um, I've learned how to be resilient and bounce back and develop skills which will feed me. Um, I, over the course of that entire time, I think I was in seven, seven homes. Um, Is that seven homes? Yeah, yeah seven, seven homes. Yeah. yeah, in three years. It's kind of hard to count them all sometimes. Yeah. Um, and the last home I wound up in, my foster mom uh, really pushed me to graduate high school. And even though it was hard, it was such a struggle. Because when, you, when you're figuring out how just to survive at an age of you know, 14, when you have the entire world on your, your shoulders and you're acutely aware that you don't have any place, no matter what, you're always the foster care. I remember I lived with one family in my um, freshman year of high school where every Friday night, the family would pack up and they would, they would go out to dinner. And I, re I remember the first time that I, saw, I heard the garage door open, I panicked and I, I went down into the, the garage and the, f the father looked at me and he goes, no, this is for family only. So I, immediately at that, oh at that age, I was aware that I had absolutely no place to be and no one to belong to. And um, when I was... 16, I finally met a woman that claimed me as her own and, and pushed me to be the best me I could be and, and had accepted no excuses and, and made me aware that, that you did have choices and that you weren't defined by the choices that people make for you. And so I moved to Philadelphia when I was 18 and I still remember every night I would drive back to Coryville to my foster mom's house to go to bed and then get up in the morning and drive back to my apartment in Philadelphia. And this went on, this went on for like six months. And then one night I came home and she had put a padlock on the door in my room and she says, you need to go. And I, I remember how heartbreaking and scary it was because even though I had been into the world, I've never really fully s stepped into the world. And so there I was, 18 in Philadelphia and trying to figure it out. You know, and uh, yeah, just trying to figure it out. And eventually, I wound up in Vermont for a while at a hippie school, you know, where the, all the tables were circles and dogs were allowed in class. And, you know, everyone had a label. They were, you know, everybody was an ist or a vegetarian. or It was really cool. It was a, a point, a place to find conviction, and, and, which I had never had before. I didn't know you could question the patriarch and question uh, question everything you grew up knowing and you could claim something you yeah. could come claim a conviction and I was every one of them you know <laughs> socialist feminist vegetarian <laughs> you name it I was down the line and from there I could only handle a few winters there because when it snowed it snowed a foot and it's crazy <laughs> That's so crazy. And then at the end of the, I was in Burlington, and then at the end of every season, when all the snow would melt, there was just dog shit everywhere. Oh. So it was just like, you go from three feet of snow to dog poop? You know, this is not the life for me. So I came back to Lancaster and eventually graduated from Millersville. Okay. Yeah, it took a while. But I, what I was your degree in? Anthropology and women's studies. Cool. Yeah. So then how did you end up in, it's funny that you, told the story about you going back to Quarryville because just from what I know about how much you traveled after that I and know. were like adventurous I and know. out there, it's, it's interesting to hear kind of that beginning. Yeah. So after you graduated, how did you end up in LA? Well, I, I tried to go back to Quarryville for a while, but then I realized how horrible the place it was. I mean, high school was just you know, riddled with like being bullied and, you know, I'd still see these people, but they all had children at that point. So I, I lasted about two months and then I discovered a band called Fish and then <laughs> I was on tour. That's what I did. We would, I had a boyfriend and we traveled across country and he really fell in love with LA and, um, he moved out to LA and I decided when I was 25 that I wanted to be with him and Moved out to LA for a while. I lived in Huntington Beach. I worked across the street from World Industries. I was a receptionist in a, um, 
an architecture firm and it was kind of in a bubble window but I could see all the guys skateboarding out front <laughs> it was the greatest job ever to sit on the phone and just see just these guys <laughs> yeah yeah pulling ollies with world That's industry awesome. it had just begun too it, you know it's like 98 and it was right in Huntington on the this cul-de-sac <laughs> Um, I was fired from that job for insubordination, like most of them. Most of them. That's why I've always had to be self-reliant. But, and then that was fun to be in Huntington. It was kind of surreal to be in LA. It was one of the better times of my life. I would uh, often would visit um, San Juan Capistrano and go to the mission, always hoping to catch the swarm of swallows that would come in or maybe like a glimpses of Marilyn Monroe somewhere, you know. <laughs> and, but it was a it was a great place to be. It taught me it taught me about being outside and learning to find peace without with, with being outside, which I'd never I'd never known how to be still prior to that, which I don't either now. I'm still <laughs> like you know. But it was a beautiful experience. And then after that was it Oregon? Yeah, I went. I wound up, of course, deciding I didn't love the guy from LA, but I loved the guy from Oregon. Ah. So I wound up <laughs> in Oregon, um, went to Oregon, and the man I was in love with didn't bother to ever tell me that he was living with his girlfriend. Yeah. So I showed up in yeah. Oregon, and suddenly there I was. I couldn't go back to LA, and I sure knew I couldn't come home. So there I was, and that's when I learned to ask people. For help because I was in the middle of Bend, Oregon. I didn't know anybody, and within a week, I found a job. I found a place to live, and learned about the kindness of strangers, which really put a lot of um, instilled a lot in me about about stopping stopping to ask. You know, you never know someone's story. Like if someone has a look of distress, they probably are in distress, and it's time to stop and. And ask them, hey, what's going on? Do you need help? And yeah. yeah. So you stay there. I did know. stay there. I stayed there for a while. I stayed there for a few years and dealt with the cold and and just had a blast. It was a good time to be in Bend, Oregon, hiking in the desert. And I lived with a bunch of um, furniture makers. So we would sneak out into the forest at night and, and take juniper. <laughs> it was always like renegade stuff. And I worked there for a while with the Deschutes Forest Service um, doing a dendrochronology study about the long-term effects of fire on, um, on juniper growth, old juniper growth. So I would, I spent I guess a year and a half in a lab counting juniper tree rings. So for about a period of six months, every time I looked up, I just saw rings everywhere. Yeah. I felt like I was in an episode <laughs> of Dumbo, you know, just this rings everywhere. And from there, I went to Idaho one time for a rafting trip on the Salmon River and just never came back. Yep, packed it, went back, packed everything up, and I lived out of my car on the banks of the Salmon River for a summer and just loved every minute of it. Yep. It was eventually I um, worked in a town called Riggins, which is the whitewater capital of Idaho. Um, and it's really cool. It's on the little, the confluence of the little salmon and the big salmon are there. And it's the Salmon River is the longest undammed river in the country. But it's also in a place called a batholith which granite and basalt have merged. So everywhere you go, there are these white sandy beaches and the river just flows and there's, looks like there's crimson river, ribbons of salmon in there and these gray rocks everywhere. But Idaho is also the gem state and there's a rapid on this river called Ruby Rapid where there are these huge boulders that garnet are embedded in. So everything around you is just like this over sensory of colors and yeah. textures and and tangible items like you can you can pick up a handful of of garnets and you know maybe find a ruby in there it's such a magical place now i have a new place i want to go oh you right. gotta go <laughs> and okay. i i was there until i was about 31 i'd fallen in love with a river guide and is this the most beautiful man in the world nope that's no, my baby's that's daddy okay. yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, I had fallen in love with him, and and we we had so many adventures. We would go down to um, California, and and lived. We lived at um, a biodiesel uh, commune for a while outside of Petaluma. 
we'd go to, every February, we'd go to Tucson, Arizona for the Gem and Mineral Show for a while and just hang out with a bunch of hippies and talk rocks and hit every hot spring. We would, we'd have goals. We'd go away for a week and try to hit every hot spring along the Bitterroot up into Montana. It was just a, it was such a great experience. And then when I was 31, I think, yeah, I was 31, I was in Riggins one year bartending for Christmas and I was hanging out with all my old guy friends, you know, all the local guys who'd always come in to see me. And we were hanging out um, at the table and I had dropped my napkin and everybody around me was 65, but it never really dawned on me that everybody was so much older. And I dropped my napkin and I went to pick it up off the floor and I looked at everyone's sneakers and I'm surrounded by a bunch of old guys with Velcro <laughs> sneakers on. And I was like, I need to leave. <laughs> like, this is, this is where I've wound up. There's so much world out there and I need to go. So I packed up and moved to Boise. And, and that's when I met. That's when you met the most, that's when I met the the most okay. handsome man I've ever met. Yep, I was uh, a day manager at a bar. And in walks this guy for a job interview with a Sector 9 longboard and, and a flannel on. You know, and uh, a man bun before they were man buns. And I was done for. And then <laughs> I was done, walked right into a wall. Uh, yep, and that's where that's how it all started, and that's how it ended, pretty much, I'd have to say. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so then with him, you ended up leaving the country. <laughs> leaving the country. Um, we were in Idaho, and you, being in Boise is kind of a little bit of a liberal bubble in Idaho, and I don't think it really ever dawned on us, like, how conservative of a place that we had we were living in as far as Idaho, you know, racism is prevalent and and uh we were kind of naive and in a really lovely bubble and when um Bush was going to be elected we could see this I think in two thousand and one it was quite evident that what was going on with the political situation in the war, um, we decided to leave the country. Because we could. Yeah. So we left the country and we first headed to Thailand. Um, he had been, a, he had lived as a, in a monastery for a while and he really enjoyed Thailand. So we wound up in Thailand for a bit. So what did you do there? <laughs> well, we did that. Well, we traveled. We were, um, we did a few Vipassana meditations, which is a 10 day silent meditation. Um, there are centers all over the world. And it was hard. It's a hard. That's one of the hardest things I've ever done. Is had to sit for ten days. Um, my very first meditation, fourth day in, I got a lovely case of dysentery and just oh. said, "Screw it all." After yeah. that, anybody who'd walk by, I'd say, Psst, "You speak English?" Psst. Like I was exceptionally disruptive and had to be talked to a lot. But you couldn't leave the meditation center because they held your passport. Yeah, but I um. Eventually, it turned out to be one of the best experiences I've ever had because all the Thai women would sneak me snacks. And then somebody <laughs> snuck me a, a Herman Hess book, The Glass Menagerie, and I got to read that, hit out my room, and just shove down bananas and yogurt. And I didn't have to go to the meditations. <laughs> it was great. I felt like it was a major act of defiance. And <laughs> That is awesome. So what did you do? for money like to survive well eventually <laughs> you kind of we, around. Yeah, yeah we really did we we um we were in thailand until our money ran out and we went to laos and we were in laos for a while just traveling I, we had enough money to live for about a year because we were smart about it and um and we started an import expert business at one point because we figured that would be a great way to help local people and local economies and also be able to go home and back and forth, which was eventually the, the goal. Because we both loved, I, I loved Southeast Asia. It was a great place where the food was fantastic and the people are lovely. And, 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 and it's, it's wonderful to live in a culture where you don't really speak the language. You don't really know what's going on. You can check out. Mm -hmm. It's really great, you know. Um, we wound up in... Miramar for quite some time and this was just after the uh, junta had taken the government out of Rangoon and moved the government up into uh, the mountains so it's kind of a volatile time to be in Miramar but we 
we wound up in this town called Old Bagan where we had friended a, a local kid. And this kid was, he was just something. He uh, spoke English and he would review his English lessons with us. And his, his mother, her name was Pai Sui, she became a good friend. Um, she would dress me in, in Burmese wear and I would have, they had this like chalk you put on your cheeks. So I was this bright red, sweaty redhead with these like chalk <laughs> on my cheeks and, these, and this Burmese attire. And this little boy, oh, he was something. He, um, his mom's name was Pai Sui. I, I always forget his name. I have a great picture of him in my room. Um, he would always come over to Kyle and I, that's Quinn's dad, and he'd say, say things like, my mom's so fat. <laughs> <laughs> and we would laugh, and his mom was just glowing. My mom's so old, he would say. And the more we laughed, the prouder his mom was. Aww. So it was a great experience. And we eventually, um, ran out of money because we just kept giving money to this family. And um, at one point we did a hike, like a 50 kilometer hike, and about in through Inlay Lake and up through the Karen District, and essentially a really illegal hike. I mean, I look back at, at it now and just think that that's probably the stupidest thing you've ever done. But two kilometers into the hike, I lost my shoes. <laughs> so I had to do the remaining 48 um, kilometers without shoes on. <laughs> and every time I started to feel sorry for myself, I'd seen an 80-year-old Burmese woman with, you know, like a 30-pound pound bag of peanuts on her head, and I would, I would get it back into perspective quickly. But we, we wound up in the back country of Miramar, and our tour guide was one man named Robert, and the other tour guide looked like a Burmese William Defoe. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, one night we got drunk on rice whiskey and... We were in a monastery. We stayed in a monastery that night, and it was a full moon. And I'll never forget, it was October 12th, and I got to teach the Burmese William Defoe, our tour guide, and, and um, the handsome man, uh, how to play hopscotch under the full moon in this <laughs> monastery. That was one of my best memories. But eventually, after that night, Robert, our tour guide, he was sick. He was uh, vomiting. So we wound up for two days at a, um, a house of a, a, a woman healer. Mm -hmm. And um, Kyle and I got to sleep in the potato bin area and um, downstairs underneath the house. And I'll never forget that there was one point where we heard a noise and we went upstairs and here Robert was laying on the floor and there were these three women. And they were, I learned that they were the um, part of the the um, flower mung people, and they had these huge, like nine foot ceramic horns, and they were doing a vibrational therapy on him. And we got to, we got to see part of that, and it was really great. And then the, the very following day, we had to go up to uh, one of Robert's sister's house, um, and we were inside of this house, and we looked up. And in every window is a beautiful child's face looking at us, just staring at us, because most yeah. of them had never seen foreigners, let alone a redhead. Yeah. And uh, Kyle was really good at always figuring out how to like just capture the moment. And he made paper. He made a paper airplane, and it was brilliant because we flew paper airplanes with a group of twenty Burmese kids, and most kids have never even seen a paper yeah. airplane. And you, I've never heard the sound of that kind of laughter in my life. After that, that was pretty cool. But at that point, we realized that we needed to get out of the country because if we didn't leave, we never would. And um, we received a, someone spoke English, and we had to um, take a ride into Rangoon. And we sat in the potato truck, and <laughs> they threw the 80-year-old woman out of the front and put her in the back with a stack of potatoes so I could sit up front. And I was just <laughs> devastated. I was like, no, 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 no. But it was a, a, it was a great lesson in learning of what, how foreigners were treated in other countries. It's really, uh, it's a really sad thing. So we wound up in Rangoon and we had, a, had originally crossed the, in the southern border called the Golden Triangle um, of, of Myanmar, um, Laos and Vietnam. We had walked across the border, but we were told, and I think this was in 2004, this all happened. We went to the embassy because we were out of money and we needed to, we needed to get money to get out of the country. And 
um, there had been a few bombings in Rangoon, and there had been some monks that had been shot, and it was a really scary time. We went to the embassy, and um, the U.S. consulates told us that if we had crossed south where we were, that we would definitely be killed because there had been a huge um, U.S. Uh, drug bust, and a bunch of poppy plants had been destroyed. And there was also, the U.S. had just put a sanction on all transactions going into Miramar. So there was absolutely no way to get out of the country. There was no way to get money. So the, um, the um, counselor at the embassy brought, bought all of our bot back, our Thai bot. She bought our kit back, and she slipped us a note. I have the notes. I should, get, I should show you. Um, of a hotel that had a branch in Singapore where we could have money wired to us illegally on our credit card. We went in and we did that, and we got the money, and then we flew out the, the very next day. Yeah, yeah and there, had, like within within a day or two, there was a, a bombing at a at a mosque that just killed a ton of people a, a door down from us. And it was so. From there, we went to Taiwan because we had friends in Taiwan, and we wound up in Taichung um, for a year, which is the center of Taiwan, and that's when we started teaching. But you didn't have a visa. No, we didn't have a visa. <laughs> so you yeah. were so, sneaking out of classrooms when so you were teaching. <laughs> we okay, so we wound up in Taichung, and we wound up. Um, well, I definitely did. Wound up working as an illegal alien, which oh, I learned quickly from other expats that you don't ever work at a school that controls your visa because they can revoke your visa at any time. So I I wound up at this school with a friend of mine from Oregon. Her name was Meg. Um, teaching with her, and um, I was an English teacher, and I had a group of, I guess, 35 kids in my homeroom, and they were just some of the, they were all four and five-year-olds who really know how to live life. So I was teaching at this school, and immigration would come in randomly, but we never knew we were being audited, because apparently the the president of the school had owed a bunch of money to somebody, and it wound up being that the school wound up having to close down. I'm, I'm kind of skipping ahead, but the school wound up having to close down because the guy who was married to the principal of the school owed all this money to people, and they eventually stopped paying all of our co-teachers, and eventually they stopped paying the teachers. So, And this guy wound up faking his own death, and they, they wound up arresting him in China. It was this huge thing. We were all over the news for this school. It was quite the adventure. And then the last time immigration came in, um, it was quite custom that you know, they would say, immigration, immigration. You just had to get out of the class, but you could always go to the innkeeper's house. So the last time I remember having to like sneak through the window and then haul ass to the innkeeper's house, we wound up, uh, we wound up listening to the Ramones all day and drinking uh, Lao Lao, which is rice whiskey, and just had the best day ever running from the immigration. And after about being a, a year and a half in Taiwan, you couldn't get any good cheese anywhere. It was really my, my breaking, my breaking factor. It. Yeah, blue cheese. <laughs> and I used to have to go to this place called Jimmy's Cafe. And <sighs> the woman there was from Florida. And all she ever did was just play the Carpenters over and over uh, again. So I just couldn't handle it anymore. You're done. Yeah, right. that was it. So we carpenters and no cheese. No, that's, yeah, that's it's just the breaking <laughs> factors. Done. And um, the day we left, a huge... Um, Hurricane came through Taichung. It was like narrowly escaped it was all of these. Crazy. <laughs> but it was crazy to be events. on the bus and to see the sky changing and just know that something's yeah. happening and knowing that you want to be anywhere else but where you are. But the, but living in Taiwan was was a really great experience. I um I learned a lot from the kids about the difference in language. Like uh I learned a lot about myself too. A lot of self reflection happened there. But um one year, I, I decided to write all my progress reports. I would handwrite them. And it was right around Tet. I would write them in red ink because I thought it was pretty. But apparently, I learned later when I had to rewrite them that when you write a child's name in red ink, it's considered the mark of death. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> they had gone Oops. home. You know, things they don't tell you in the Lonely yeah. Planet. But that happened. And then another time, I had decided... we I did a great community project with the kids. We wound up um, in... In the Chinese culture, a lot of times people don't ask for help because it's losing face. So I, we, I did um, 
we had been in, involved in the um, import business by that point. So I had started with the kids that I had. Um, we had built a little bubble tea workshop area where parents would buy would buy a tea. Um, Shun Shui Tong, that's what, it, that's what it was called. That was the first place the bubble tea was ever served, is in Tai, tai Chong. And I'll never forget the first day I ever um, said my proper Chinese. I said, Shun Shui Tong, and like 25 of my kids got up and clapped for me. It was just like, they were so proud of me. But I, I learned a lot from teaching there. It was, it was great. Um, I also learned at that point how kids really have it really rough in other places in the world. Like, children are dispensable. And, and that really started to resonate with me. I saw a lot of my own experiences and a lot of kids that I took under my wing. But with our, with our bubble tea shop, we, we wound up raising in that school year over $300 for a local orphanage, which was a lot of money. Yeah. So it was cool to get the kids involved in, in acts of giving back to the community. But my last Taiwan story is that um, my last project for the year, I taught at a Regio themed school, and we were supposed to introduce a theme. And then after six weeks, you had an art pad, and kids would express their interest. Of, uh, where if you learned about a firehouse, um, they would just talk about everything that they wanted to learn about, and then you would narrow it down, and you would just focus on that one thing about the firehouse or fire. And we had decided that it was going to be how to learn to um, take care of situations and accidents and also how to um, ask for help. So at my very last activity for the kids was uh, uh, in the gymnasium, I had laid out a course with tape and those little carts that you could go on of what to do if you get into a car accident. And we had a four-way intersection. So I had the kids draw out a plan. I was like, okay, if you, if you, if you land on the ground and, you, and there's a four-way crash and you are a motorcycle hit by a van, what do you do? And the kids are laying down on the ground, and um, one little boy goes over over to this one little girl. I said, what do you do? How do you ask for help? He's like, hold on. I'll be right back. <laughs> Sit still like that. And he's like, I'm going to call for help. And it dawned on me, they're emulating my behavior. Like, and so I finally said, I said, does teacher cat act that way? And they're like, oh, yeah, your coffee makes you crazy. You need to stop and calm down. Like, so that was, my, that was my, my last final day. And, and from there on out, anytime I had too much coffee, calm down, no more. You sit down like that. These kids. But it was just the funniest experience, like self-reflection of learning to see outside of yourself. And that was a lot of fun. Vietnam, right? Yes, After we were that. in Vietnam. <laughs> So we wound up in Hanoi, Vietnam, okay. which is a wonderful place to be. Um, there was not much of an expat community there as so much as in Saigon or Hoi An. I guess I should say Ho Chi Minh, you know, a little old world there. But we were in the old quarter. Um, we lived on a lake called Wan Kiam Lake, which is in the old quarter, but it was, it was a huge tourist area. And um, we just wound up teaching, uh, Kyle wound up teaching at an English school from more prominent um, European families, expat families, but I landed a job um, in a Vietnamese school. I wound up teaching there. And along the way, um, I met many, many kids, but I met one little boy named Quinn Ang who completely changed me from the inside out. I think it was the first time I ever learned what loving, a kid, what loving a kid entailed and meant, and how just one little smile could just completely wreck you in the beginning of the day. You know, he was, he was openly defiant, which took so much courage in that <laughs> culture, because kids, you know, the kids are, kids are very expendable in certain parts of the world, and corporate punishment is often mandated when a child openly just defies you with academics, but he would come in to the classroom every morning. And I, by this time, I had just started being pregnant with Quinn. And he would say, Chao Ko Cat. And then he'd lift up my shirt and he'd say, Chao Ko Embe, which is hello, teacher baby. Like that, he'd pull it down. And then he'd look around oh and he'd go sit down. And most mornings, I would say to him, you know, be good, be quiet. And he'd say, no. And I was like, all right. Like, we are going to be great friends here. And he, he just... He loved the Ramones. I would play the Ramones for him every morning. He, um, he loved to just come over and sit in my lap and be like, good morning, your boyfriend is here. Like that, and he'd stand up, and he'd flex for me. 
and then he would just go out. And this was this kid just. And how old was he? He was five. <laughs> He That's was awesome. five, but he had a father named Tomas, and I talked to Thomas one day. I, I mean, I definitely felt so many parallels with him, and I had learned that he was, um, that he actually, he resonated around me because of all the love I gave him, I think, and I learned that he had been put up for adoption um, and was in the process of being adopted by a German family when the Vietnam government had shut down adoptions. So there were 18 kids lost in transition and they were they were adopted by people within the embassy or other local families. And Quinn Aang had been adopted by this German man and a um, Chinese mother and he was he was originally put up for adoption because he had a double cowlick in the front of his head. And that was that was the most beautiful thing I have ever seen were these two swirls that just went in separate directions, you know? And that's that's how Dispose, that's how, I mean, cult, cultural differences are cultural differences and superstitions are superstitions, mm-hmm. but it just kind of blew my mind that this beautiful, perfect child who w- was disposable like that. And I am. Um, because of cowlicks. Because of two cowlicks, yeah. yeah. But it was a sad time. Mm. And then at that point also, I was volunteering with a nonprofit that was dealing with child trafficking. It was, a, it was an Australian NGO. And what they did was um, men would pose as either sex tourists or work tourists, and they would go even to Hoi An, which is in the central of Vietnam, or to um, Ho Chi Minh, and buy kids. And they would bring them up to Hanoi. And the average age that someone lives at home in Vietnamese culture is about 26. So they would set up these homes, and guys would live there till they were about 26. Some were dealing with drug addiction. A lot were dealing with abandonment issues. But the local hotels would train these kids as, um, as cooks or tour guides. So they would learn English or German, which German is the other um, most spoken language in Vietnam. And they would learn living skills. And they worked at like Bobby Chang's restaurant in Hanoi. The Hilton would hire all these kids. So it was really fun. I, I got to teach English with these kids. But their stories always, always were just like mine, you know, there is so much common ground in, in these stories, but, uh, and I, and I think, I think we were able to heal, a lot of the kids and I were able to kind of heal through, through, um, the same kind of plight, but, mm. and it was at this point where we had decided to set up an import business and start that in the States where we would buy directly from artists, but artists who, um, worked within the community of the NGO. So then from there, how did you end up back in Pennsylvania? Well, in 2007, the APEC conference was in Vietnam in Hanoi, and Bush wound up staying at the end of our driveway, at the end of our cul-de-sac at the Marriott. <laughs> and, and I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> we, from my roof deck, I could see the Marriott Hotel that he rented out for $7 million of taxpayers' money. And... Um, <laughs> and um, Kyle was really upset about it, and one night he was on his way to work, and we lived in this around the lake, and it was called a sex. So, um, at the end of the driveway was a gate, and as he got right to the end of the the road, the gate closed, and Bush's entourage pulled out. So he was an hour late because of Bush's entourage, which I, that was the day I'm like, I'm going home. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go home. I'd miss Turkey Hill ice cream and ketchup. I was and I wanted to give birth in the states. I also knew that if I didn't give birth in the states, I would never be fully present with my for my daughter. So at eight months, one week pregnant, I came back to the East Coast to Lancaster and delivered a baby. Yeah, at the only place. That I named Quinn after this child, after oh, Quinn Ang, because every time I say her name, I say his name, and I, 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 and it's a song for all the kids out there who go without love, who go without validation, or appreciation, who go without knowing that that they do make a difference and they are essential to to this great adventure of life. You know, I think people forget that they were kids at one point, and it's really important to remember that. Mm-hmm. So you and the handsome man were together for a while while you were here. For a while, you had we were a, here. Yes, a business. Right we there. had a business starting uh, making candles from recycled liquor bottles, which eventually was shut down by a major liquor company for 
uh, copyright infringement. And they said we were we were like we were. They said we were recopying the labels, and um, I of course found a loophole in it where people could send us the bottles. But after that point, we couldn't get insurance anymore. It was a huge business, and we um, we shut that down. And and eventually, um, he decided to move back to Oregon, and Quinn and I were left to our own devices. And it was it was devastating. It was devastating. Um, at that point, right before he left, I had um, realized that she was something was going on with her. She would um, come down with pneumonia quite often, and um, we I learned that, wound up learning that she had um, severe chronic asthma. And so it was it was a really hard journey those first few years, and it, it still is as a constant monitoring monitoring of um, environment. You know, I don't I don't sleep at night. It's you get up at get up to check to see if she's breathing. I, if she has a certain cough, I have to turn on the humidifier. If it's another kind of cough, I have to wake her up, you know, to get her fluids. And it's just, it's been, it's been a battle of trying to find the right doctor who will um, not treat her with, with just more, more drugs. But, you know, I've definitely have learned to be an advocate. You have to be an advocate for your kid's medical needs. And it's taken three different hospitals and like, umpteen specialist, but we, we finally landed a place. We um, were at Hershey every month to see a specialist, and it's finally under control. And she's actually started growing and observing nutrients, and yeah, it's, it's, it's manageable now. Yeah. How old was she when? Um, when this all started, uh, five, four, four years old. Okay. Yep. But it also leaves me in a situation where I am, um, as being a single parent, I, of course, have to be accessible for her, but I have to be accessible for her regarding health needs at all points. So I, I had to figure out a way to make a living, which is when I started my cleaning business because it's um, called Mother's Green Cleaning. And um, it's been very successful the last four years running. And I, I have a business partner named Jocasta Perez, and we hire other women who are going through adversity or overcoming adversity and usually who have children who have to be accessible to the kids, nine to three at a living wage. And um, you can put your kid on the bus and you can pick your kid up from school. And it's, it's been really, people have been really receptive to it and hopefully business will continue to grow. But I, I think it's, it's important to learn how to overcome adversity and within every problem, you, you know, there's a solution to it within every. Well, yeah, everything yeah, you like there's, you figured out there's a way an to opportunity to every problem. problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, can you see yourself doing this for you know the foreseeable? Future? I I don't really have a choice. Okay. Um, <laughs> in the matter, I'm a single mom, yeah. you know, with a kid that I have to be all things for. But um, so I have to, I continue to do my artwork and be creative, but it's something that I have to put a hundred percent into to make it grow so that I can help other mothers too, because um, when you're on your own and you have to do everything, the first thing that you have to do is just be, be, a, be a parent and be present for your kids. And if you're working 12 hours a day at a minimum wage job, you're not able to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the other part of your business kind of also deals with Quinn's issues. Yes, so can yes. you tell us a little bit we, um, about that? Well, I, um, it's a green and clean business. So we really focus on families who have kids who have autoimmune disorders or um, older people who have autoimmune disorders. And um, we, we use, well, I made a cleaning product that I'm in the process of marketing and trying to launch. But um, everything's pet safe, kid, kid friendly, and, and especially environmentally friendly. That's great. Yeah. So do you have any advice, I guess, for maybe other women that are in your situation? I mean, you talked a lot about um, people helping others and being able to ask for help and, you know, is that kind of something that you still live by or recommend to other uh, I Yeah, I think, I, I think it's important to stop and, and ask those around you what they need, but also to show the appreciation in those around us, you know, to, to recognize the, the beauty and, and name the beauty in those around you and the children around you and especially within yourself because you aren't defined by the choices that people make for you. It, it, you are capable of overcoming them and creating your own path. 
and and it's important to find your strength within. Within every problem, there's an opportunity. And how can you find that opportunity to become the most best you that you can be, the most complete you that you can be? Oh, I think in all those experiences I've learned is that I'm always haunted by how dispensable people are um, around us, that surround us. And I think it's really important to to, like I say, state the beauty and value in those around you and to let people know why you appreciate them and how you appreciate them because you never know what little word, words will lift somebody up and out of a situation and reinforce their self-belief and give them hope. You know, and from hope, every you can launch everything from hope, just having the little bit, bit of hope. But above all, it's it's easy to be kind. It's it's not hard, it's not complex. It's, e it's easy to put yourself aside and be kind and move forward through kindness and with kindness.